Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to continue our study on Judges chapter 15. Before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time that we have each morning. Thankful for this new week and an opportunity to study your word together. We invite your Holy Spirit to direct our minds, to enlighten us, and to strengthen us for the trials that lie ahead. We pray for each person that you can help them with their particular needs. And you know, Lord, uh, the needs of this movement um, and the messages that you've been giving us help us to heed them, to take um, responsibility for our part in what has happened in this movement. Forgive us for our sins. Help us to trust in your righteousness and not our own. Be with us in this study as we continue to lay down the lines in the book of Judges. Correct us when we are in error and help us to see the things that are the most needful. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, when we look at, and we're going to go back over a couple of things just um, to clarify a few things that, I, that we're struggling with here. And one of the main things we've been looking at is this 300. So uh, <clears throat> Tom had written me uh, a chat, given me a message on WhatsApp, and, and he mentioned uh, the 300 charts. So we all know that the 1843, there were 300 of them. And so that's something that we've always connected with the 300 in Gideon. Um, and then we can say that the charts, the 1843 and the 1850 chart, are these two loaves, right? So if we go, I guess I can show this again. So we're looking at these first fruits. Um, Collins and Odilia's presentations, and we're putting that as these two lobes, these offerings. And we already connected that with the charts. But the fact that there is 300 of the 1843 chart and also 300 of the 1850 chart. So both charts, they made 300 of those. And um, so that ties them together as well to this 300. So then we have the 300 foxes. And of course, we connected that with um, the two periods of 150 days in the story of Noah with the first day of the 10th month. And of course, the story of Noah has the removing of the roof of the ark on the first day of the first month in the 601st year of Noah's life. Now, so the fact that we have that first day of the 10th month and the first day of the first month, just as we do in the story of Ezra, in connection with the divorcement, then when we look at this span of time that's given us in two different symbols, uh, dealing with December 5th, December 25th, 2020, um, and January 11th, 2023, which is coming up this week, um, we're still struggling trying to understand what this is. Now, if we connect it to the charts, if we look at these two lows as these messages and we connect it to the charts and we see that Samson is going to, uh, there's this. So what we did with the foxes, uh, we said that these are false prophets. So we weren't going to turn those morally on their head as we did with other things, because we're taking these symbols um, and, and we're keeping these symbols consistent because we don't see them as morally ironic, right? So the, the foxes themselves are a symbol of false prophets. And, and the question is, how do we connect these? How do we connect the fact that there is these two lobes, which we are taking in a positive sense, <clears throat> Odilio study and Colin study? And yet we're, we're, Samson is going to come and take these 
300 foxes. So that is a, a false message. And, and basically, what does he do? Because this we still haven't really resolved on how we look at this. Because this is creating a chiasm, right? And this is... Um, so this is the period of the divorcement. So the period of the divorcement is addressing these 300 foxes. That's how we're taking it. Is that, the, is that where we would place those 300 foxes on the first day of the 10th month? We've discussed this before. Um, so I know you guys have had time to think about it because we've been discussing it for a while. Is there something about... T the taking of Collins and Odilia's messages and, and putting them in the structures like we're doing. Is that what's being characterized by the story of Samson? That's, that's one option. Okay, yes, that's one option. But if we're really going to look at this, especially having to, to deal with the 300, mm -hmm. we have multiple examples of 300 within scriptures. Yeah, we've looked at all the 300s. So, so we did that in detail before. Well, so we know we got the shields of brass, we got uh, um, these 300 foxes, we have the story of Gideon, um, we have the 250 day periods in the story of Noah, which are connected to the first day of the 10th month, and the first day of the first month in, in that context. We have Genesis 5.22, where Enoch walked with God 300 years. Yep, we have the 300 years of Enoch. Yep. We have Ezra 8.5, where Shechaniah were, three, were 300 males. But the one that I'm, I'm looking at here, Esther 9.15. Okay. The Jews slew 300 men at Sushan. Yeah. Now, if we if we jumped into the New Testament, of course, we have Judas accusing his cousin of being exorbitant and making the comment that the ointment could have been sold for 300 pence. Mm -hmm. And that's just a that's just a quick run. Yeah. So we have all these different. <laughs> 300s and so what does the 300 represent just it as itself as a symbol if we took all these stories of 300s that we looked at i mean one is we know it's an expansion of three And so is 30, right? Yes, on the 30 question. Okay. Yeah, so 30. So we got the, the 30. So we so we know that these three days that we have in the story of Ezra and, and the three months that the divorce is going to occur in, that this three becomes a symbol. So we've looked at three, we've looked at 30, we've looked at 300. And we now have this 300 foxes. And, and since they're in a chiasm, right, we're going to, we're going to take the 250-day periods in the story of Noah, which gives us this way mark that we had been looking at all along, the first day of the 10th month, right? 
and its connection to the first day of the first month. And the first day of the first month is when the water abates. And um, we know that the first day of the 10th month, because when we, when we looked at this, there was um, basically 30 days from uh, the time that the water begins to abate to, to the first day of the 10th month in which you see the tops of the mountains, right? Now, in the story of Noah itself, though, from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month, in the chronology that I've reconstructed, we have 120 days rather than 90 days or any other number of days, right? So it's going to be four months in the story of Noah. And, and so the number 120, what do we associate it with? The close of probation in Genesis 6-3. Okay, so we can connect it to the 120 years, right? So that's going to be the first, the, the law of first mention as far as you know, any sort of prophetic symbol. I don't know if there's anybody who's 120 when they have a kid or anything. And I've looked at that. Are you considering the that as the first time prophecy in, in Genesis 6-3? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, because that's, that's the first mention right there, isn't it? Yeah, that's my understanding. So that's the law of first mention. And, and it's in 6-3, and 6-3 is what? Um, it's Pentecost. The sixth day of the third month, the sixth of Sivan, right? And do we associate 120 with Pentecost? Sure do. <laughs> 120 in, in the upper... Right. So... So, so we do. So we have all these symbols coming together. I mean, I know people think it's weird when we take a Bible verse and all of a sudden, you know, that that number, but it's already connected with 120. Right. Abraham was 120 when he's told to sacrifice Isaac, Stephen says, Stephen says. And um, we also know that there's the 120 years of the three kings of United uh Israel, right? 40 years for each of those kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. Um, and of course, the 120 uh, shows up when I did the 391.5 days. I, I looked at the 120 days. And we also had the, I think it was an hour and 20 minutes, not 120 minutes that Jeff presented on that 9-11 sermon that was um, closing Pentecost in 2017 and, and uh, beginning Sabbath. But that was the sixth day of the third month on the biblical calendar. So, so we have all of, the, all of these different ties, these different symbols. So we can see that Pentecost is, is tied in with this. Um, even though we have three months you know, in the story of Ezra, and we have these symbols that bring us to April 5th, 2030, we also have, in a sense, the symbol of 120. And, and we, we already have Pentecost there because we have, of course, the first fruits, Colin's presentation, and then 49 days later, on the 50th day, you have Odilio's presentation. And so, again, we we're, we're just keep tying these symbols together. We keep layering them on top of each other. What we, what we don't have is a conclusion of what this means, right? So I've taken the position that um, Collins and Odilio's presentations are these two loaves, which we can connect to the two charts, 120 lo loaves of showbread in Solomon's temple, Stephen says. So again, you have this symbol of 120 in connection with the loaves. That's the showbread, of course, not the Pentecost loaves, but still, they're still loaves. These ones are leavened. Now, if they're leavened, 
and this I think is the point that Tom was bringing out. If they're leavened, does that mean they they have um, error attached attached to them that needs to be baked out? So Stephen says yes, right? And I mean, and this is this has been the process of these studies from the beginning. Because one of the things that we have looked at regarding Miller's rules that I don't think um, Miller specifically or explicitly states, and, and we're going to look at this this afternoon when we look at um, darkness, because we're going to look at reform lines sim uh, simply presented, the lines simply presented. And I'm going to spend a bit of time looking at darkness today. But um, uh, when, when it comes to the error that exists, because in a reform line, a reform line is a response to darkness, right? And, and the reason that we are studying the Bible is because men are in darkness. We need the light from God's word. Right? And we use all of these symbols, you know, the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. Um, God's word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And we understand the symbol of light, right? So when we're going to God's word, we're going there for light, for truth. But that's because we are in error. We are in darkness. We have misapprehension of the character of God. We have all kinds of errors that need to be collect corrected. And, and this movement is a reform line. And remember, darkness goes all along a reform line. You know, you don't get all of the darkness removed right at the beginning of a reform line. Uh, it's just that light is presented and light is followed and God continually uh, corrects his people, those that respond to the light. It's an increase of light. And when we look at what Colin and Odilio presented, one, one is we have to recognize the truth of it. That is, we know that it, it's not, and I, I don't believe that in any way was what Colin doing or Odilio doing coming from some kind of satanic spirit that they're somehow in error where they're not following God. Right. Just because we have things in our thinking that's incorrect, that's not doesn't mean we're not following God, because all of us have things that are incorrect, things that we constantly are corrected about. The question is, when light comes to us, are we going to respond to that light? That that is the question. And Satan has done a lot over the past year um, and more to hinder the light by creating these problems within the movement. You know, from my perspective, if, if Colin, if I hadn't been interrupted in my questioning of Colin in that study on December 25th, 2021, um, and there's a lot of ifs, I mean, if we had decided to study together, um, you know, work together on that, that Sabbath that people had participated in, um, all of the different studies that were happening instead of just focusing upon their own group. Um, if, if I hadn't been interrupted and questioned, if I hadn't been, from what I understand, basically attacked for asking a valid question and having my, my character sort of dragged through the mud um, for asking that question, uh, I think this movement would be in a lot different position than it is today. Doesn't mean that, you know, I did everything right or anything like that. I'm not trying to, like, excuse my actions in, in that sense, because there's definitely things that I've done that have uh, contributed to a large degree what's happened in the movement. But all of us are being corrected. So we're not just being corrected in our thinking. We're being corrected in our characters. And so, so we know that if we had followed God's counsel together as a movement and spent the time studying what Colin was presenting and then what Odilia was presenting and doing it 
in the manner that the Millerites did, we would be in a lot different position than we are today. But, you know, those are ifs. I mean, we can obviously see that God has foreseen these things. and We can be thankful that he forgives us and that he continues to give us light. But I still think to a large degree that the light that we need is in these, these studies that Colin and Odilio presented. That, that there's something there that we haven't yet understood now the error from my perspective is that they were drawing conclusions uh, about what was going to happen when and i thought that that was a mistake based on what god had already shown us regarding dates but yet we still have future dates right so partly in response to what happened is with, with Collins and Odilio studies is this development of this understanding of April 5th, 2030, which, which I think is what these studies actually relate to. That is, I think that the light that was given on these studies was meant for us to understand something about the future. Not that we're going to predict some event. I'm not, I don't believe that we're now going to, you know, somehow understand you know what events going to happen on april 5th 2030 or anything like that because i still believe that until that date passes we won't fully understand its significance but um i do think that we will understand more than we do now um but that there is something about what's here that is supposed to be healing for this movement that is this divorcement it's not about divorcing, you know, the different parties in this movement. It's not about a separation of people. It's about a separation of uh, truth from error, or really error being separated from truth to be removed. It's, it's separating the precious and the vile from the vile, right? That's what I believe has to happen. And whether this date in its symbolic sense helps us to do that, which I think is, is true. I mean, I know that that must be part of it is it gives us a key to understanding the lines. Um, but these 300 foxes, then it must be taking something from what Colin and Odilio have presented and creating a structure. Here, you know, we have the symbol of the chiasm being tied tail to tail with the torch in the middle. So we have the cross in the middle of a chiasm. So, I mean, that, that's, that's at least a start. Do people think that that's the right direction? So what did you say 300 meant? Well, that's so we know that 300 relates to the three days, right? So the three days is the three days and three nights. That's the time that Christ, from the time he is crucified until his resurrection. So it relates at least to that, which, of course, is the center of a chiasm, right? This, right, the cross becomes the center of the 70th week. And, of course, we know that this um, April 5th, 2030 date first came to us from studying the week of Christ. So 2018 is when I first had that first day of the first month. And so this is about the cross of Christ. Um, it's about our experience. And so the 300, because remember with the 300 in Gideon, we had them... Um, uh, divided into three groups, right? So those three representing the three days. And then we also have um, the, the idea that the center of a chiasm, which we get from the story of Noah, because you have the 300 days, the water prevail, 300, or not 300, 150 days, the waters prevail, and 150 days that the waters abate, making 300 days. 
And so the center of that uh, is, a, is the center of a chiasm. So, and then we have also in the story of Ezra, we have these chiastic structures that are created in connection with uh, the chronology of 457 BC. So the 300, I mean, as a symbol, if we were going to try to distill that down to a word, what would the 300 represent? We're just going to take 300. We're going to say, here's the number 300. It's a symbol. It's a symbol of what? I'm sorry. Can you phrase uh, have that question again, please? If you if you just have the number three hundred and you're going to write down, you know, you got like twelve represents the covenant or, or the church or things like that. Seven represents perfection. If you were going to write three hundred down. What does 300 represent? 144,000. Okay, how do you get it? It represents the 144,000. Gideon and okay. um, Judges, I think, is what it is. Okay. So so, so we're using Gideon. We're going to say that uh, um, that's going to represent the 144,000. Okay. That okay. Okay, so let's let's take a look at this again. So we're going to look at three hundred. So we know it's it's going to deal with Samson, these three hundred foxes. Now now, these are counterfeits, right? The false prophets. So, I mean, is this a counterfeit 144,000? We know that Enoch lives 300 years after giving birth to Methuselah. We know that... Um, And, and we looked at 300 in connection with uh, Benjamin's given 300 pieces of silver and five. We also have the length of the ark was 300 cubits. Okay, right. So the length of the ark's 300 cubits. The number of them that lap putting their hand to their mouth was 300. Judges 7 6. Gideon retained those 300 men, 7 8. Uh, 300 is a symbol for 276, nearly 300 souls. Sketches right. from life of Paul, 270. Yeah. Now, we also know the 300 in, in the Battle of Thermopylae, right? The 300 Spartans. So even though that's not a biblical thing, it's, it's still um, uh, connected to it in, in that... Uh, and, and that might, yeah, in that period of time, back yeah, then. yeah, because we connected into the story of Esther, the Xerxes. Okay, um, the three hundred pieces of silver for the ointment that they could have sold it for. Um, and the three hundred shields. And then they were replaced by 300 shields of blast, brass. Um, so, so what could we say? I mean, 144,000 is on the table. I don't know if I'm completely satisfied with that. Walk with Christ. Okay. Well, maybe in some ways, how about representing a cross? That it represents the cross. I mean, in a sense of salvation. I mean, the ark is 300 cubits. Eight souls are saved. Symbol of the resurrection. Right? You have the 250 days periods. So you have the cross in the center. So, I mean, if you're going to look at the story of Noah and you looked at the 300 cubits of the ark, you would say salvation. Right? 
I mean, so I can see that the 144,000 fit into that. But um, any other thoughts? So I think that's, we've covered all the 300s that I can think of. So what do you put on the symbol of three? Well, the three is is a completion, right? So it's it's uh, you know you have it with the Trinity, with the Godhead, the three, the trio, the heavenly trio, as Ellen White calls it, right? So the three persons of the Godhead, uh, the three days and three nights, and at the end of that, of course, is the resurrection. Right, which is the number eight, right? That's why the the ark with the eight souls that are saved. But um, so so you can't really separate three hundred from the number three. And and we're going to see um, with uh, Enoch, who's going to be translated. I mean, he's going to have 300 years and then he's translated. So he's not going to be resurrected. He's going to be translated. And there's a two symbols there. Of course, he's 65 when he gives birth to Methuselah. So it relates to the 2520s, but also 365 years that he lives, which relates to the length of a solar year. And then the 300 years that he lives after he has Methuselah. So that um, with the translation at the end of it. So if we're going to say that it represents these things, um, and we're going to have this. period of three months from the first day of the first month, first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month. And that we can understand that is 120, right? And of course, 120 would relate to the three kings of Judah. Um, it would relate to, uh, to Moses as well. His three periods of 40 years that mark out his life. So what are we saying that's that's supposed to happen? I mean, maybe we can't say that completely yet. And maybe whether this is just a symbol, symbolic period of time or whether it's a literal time might depend upon our reaction to things. on how this movement progresses. That's an interesting concept. Well, in some ways, I mean, it's always that way, um, you know, with prophecy. I mean, Christ could have come before this many times. And I agree. Yeah. So... You know, the way that I look at it, and maybe this isn't the best way to look at it, but God had raised up this movement for a purpose. And now we could think that this purpose is, you know, like Tabo thought, you know, we're going to have this new church and we're going to have this calling people out of the Seventh-day Adventist church, some really, really big thing. But, you know, God sometimes does pretty amazing things just for a few people. And, you know, this may be for us something that just applies to us, you know, a small number of people that God has done all these things for and shown us all, all of this light in this movement, that this movement was 
maybe just for a handful of people. It's always possible. I mean, those people can be part of something bigger as time goes on, but God is preparing people everywhere in the world. If we're, if we are to believe that it's only, you know, a few people here right now that God is working in their lives because, you know, we see all these numbers on, on these lines and think, well, God's definitely leading us. Uh, but we don't recognize that, you know, there's 7,000 in Israel that have not bowed the knee unto Baal. That God has people all over the earth studying and understanding truths um, that, that are, are absolutely needful for what's going to happen at the end of the world. They may not be studying the same things that we are in the same way that we are. So, so we don't know um, ultimately what God's purpose is for this movement. I mean, we know what, we know what is the potential if we are to follow God, and, that, and that's, of course, of true for anyone on, in this world. That, um, but I believe that there has to be so many other people studying truth. Like God isn't dependent upon, upon us, so to speak. Right? There's many, he can use the stones themselves to cry out. But from our perspective as as people, we have to take this seriously, that this is God speaking to us, and that um, this is a responsibility that has been placed upon our shoulders. And it's a huge responsibility. It doesn't mean we take it lightly. We can't just say, well, God's got other people. I can just go about my life. Uh, Because our salvation is tied up in this. So, so God is preparing a people, and he's given us all of this light. And we understand these major reform lines. And there's other people who do as well. That is, the work that Jeff has done, other people are following it and studying it. Maybe slightly differently than we are. But it's still light that has been given to this world. And um, so we might just be you know, fractured off from of all that work that Jeff originally did, just a small part of that, I don't know. But anyway, you can see that, you know, we have a responsibility and, and that can be taken away from us. I mean, the Seventh-day Adventist church was raised up to be a light to lighten the Gentiles, just like the Jews were. But I mean, the candlestick's being removed out of its place if it hasn't already. And that can happen to us. Just because we had great light is no guarantee that we are going to be in God's kingdom. Because we need to respond to that light. And if we don't heed the light that God has given us, we're going to be on the outside. We're not going to be on the inside. So the question is, what is this telling us? What we see in front of us. I mean, what is it telling you as an individual? What's God been telling you about what we've been studying? Anybody? I'm sorry, Theodore. Um, The question again? What's God telling you about what we've been studying? Not just on on the big level, but, you know, I mean, you don't have to be really personal about it, but just. Well, to me, this has been an answer to a prayer that I made uh, back in the 80s. And it's been unfold, that prayer has been unfolding for a long time and started really picking up speed here in the last three years. To me personally, what is it saying? Um, 
yeah, um, you're on the right path. Okay, so so we're on the right path, which, which I mean, that's an important thing to know because we have a lot of doubts about ourselves, right? Uh, yes, <laughs> ever so much. Because <laughs> if we look at ourselves, and, and, and this is a, a really good question and that we should often ask ourselves, is am I truly following God? What are, what are my motivations? Am I self-deceived? You know, especially that comes to us when we, we're, we're confronted with failure whether it's, you know, on a personal level, you know, in relationships, whether it's jobs, whether decisions that we've made have not gone the way that we've expected, whether our relationships with the church, um, you know, with friends, all these types of things that the hopes and dreams and plans and goals and all these things uh, don't go the way that we expect. When life takes a turn, just as it did for Job, um, you know, it's, it's extremely important that we question ourselves or what we believe, not in the sense of doubting God, but doubting ourselves. Am I truly following God? Do I understand the truth? Um, so, I mean, in these crises that we have in our lives, I mean, that's... That's often what drives us to be converted in the first place is where is my life going? What have I done? You know, how have I contributed to what's happening around me as I see my world following up, falling apart? And, and that's, you know, going to be a little bit <coughs> this afternoon dealing with darkness. Cause um, so if you take this idea that, you, you had some reason you turned to God, some prayer that you needed answered. And then God responded. He responds with light because you're in darkness at that point. Now, we haven't really put this here in the respective, uh, perspective of reform line in the sense that when we go back here, um, you know, we have 9-11. We have uh, these, these different dates, July 18th, and we can say, well, this is, this is obviously uh, the arrival of the second angel. I mean, we would, we would look at it this way, right? So we're going to um, connect it that way because we're going to connect it with 9-11. That's the second angel arriving and 11-9 is the second angel arriving. If we're going to put it as, as April 19th, we're going to put it as the first day of the first month. We're going to look at it that way, right? So there's different ways that we can take these lines and construct them and, and label them. But we didn't put down, you know, first angel arrives, second angels, first angels informalized, it's empowered, the second angel arrives. We haven't really done that with these lines here. We've just put them on a line and saw the chronological structure and we can see that they relate to a chiasm, right? So Judges 13, 13, and then Samson himself with July 18th being uh, uh, these 281s. You no, know, and I probably could have even just, I don't know, I probably originally meant to do this, 81 and 18, but uh, there was two different ways in which Samson was 81, right? That is, we could take his his name uh, forward and backwards, you know, in in a, in gematria. So we, in we the gramatria, the forward right. and the reverse gematria. Right. So A is one, which is uncommon, by the way. Yeah, and Z is one. What do you mean uncommon? That you're going to have one name, one word being. No. Yeah, one word to be. Um, the same number. Uh, the same uh, amount in both directions. Right. Yeah, it's, it, that would be very rare. Uh, I mean, I could probably calculate the odds of, of that occurring. Um, you know, with a six-letter name, I could probably figure it out if I wanted to. But I would tell you it would be very rare. 
it would not be something like, you know, one in 12 or one in a hundred, it would be much rarer than that. Um, you know, so I, I mean, my guess is it would be, um, you know, at least one in 5,000, maybe. That's just a rough estimate, just doing a quick calculation. So anyway, so we have this thing about Samson and, and it gives us this structure uh, of, of this being this chiasm, the center of this chiasm, July 18th in both of these cases. And then chapter 15 is sort of an addendum to this in the sense that we have this, this end part but now it's going to expand a little bit. So we already with chapter 14 had arrived at these symbols, um, the 20th day of the ninth month, the first day of the 10th month and the first day of the first month. So, so here we're just expanding that. And we're seeing that this is relating to where the movement is presently. And, uh, you know, when we get to the end of January 11th, we have 2,640 days to April 5th, 2030. And we're going to, on January 11th, uh, have our 264th study in this series. So, so we have all of these symbols. And, and so we can now say that... Um, on a personal level, we have had this darkness and now truth is being presented to us. But we also have this symbol of the false prophet. And now we're just saying that, that Samson is exposing something here. Right, that, that's the role of Samson is to bring light to this movement. Right? That's what he would symbolize. And he does this when he takes these 300 foxes and ties them tail to tail. So I know, uh, so to go back to the question, I mean, because we look at a personal level, we can say that, as Ron says, you know, it's an answer to a prayer from, from years ago. And, and Adventism has been, for me, understanding the the prophecies, praying that, you know, I could understand the book of Revelation. And, and that God is, that we're on the right track, but that right track also exposes the fact that we are on the wrong track. At least it should. It should show us that we need to be corrected. Um, anybody know what a correction line is? Enlighten me. Okay. So in Alberta, we have our, uh, the surveyors have, have surveyed the province of Alberta and, and we have a thing called a township. Now township is six miles by six miles. So there's these, these roads that are in a, a perfect square. It's just like the Babylonian magic square, right? So we all know what that is. The numbers one to 36 arranged in 36 boxes in this six by six squares in such a way that each row adds up to 111. And so you have the number 36 symbolically representing 666. And this comes from, of course, Babylonian astronomy because they divide the heavens in, well, in different ways, but they connect it to the number 36. So even though there's 12 uh, con, you know, constellations or whatever that, that is the signs of the zodiac, they're still divided into, in each one of those, um, 12, they divide them into three so that you have 36. Um, and 
And that's why you have 360 degrees in a circle, of course, because there's a decan, at least that's the Roman name or the Latin name uh, for the idea of uh, 10 degrees. So 10 degrees is a decan in a circle. And, and that's why there's 360, um, there's 36 decans. So the sky is divided in that way or the horizon is. So, um, so this Babylonian idea of uh, 666, right? It comes to this number 36. So anyway, that's, that's a bit of an aside, but Alberta is divided into these townships. Now, um, now if you have a, um, if you try to take on a sphere and you try to place uh, all of these six mile by six mile uh, townships, uh, what, what would end up happening? Because the township lines, I mean, they're supposed to line up with the lines of, of longitude, right? So we have problems with the lines of longitude. What happens as you go further north to the lines of longitude? Or longitude, whichever it is. So when you go further north, what happens to these lines? They get, they get shorter and shorter. Well, they get closer together. So the yeah, they get latitude between the lines of longitude would be shorter. So, so the problem that you have, you know, if you're a surveyor and you start surveying long distances is you start to realize that uh, these lines of longitude get closer together. And so in order to take these squares and, and put them on the province of Alberta, which is a pretty big province, um, that you're going to have to move them over every once in a while, that they're not going to line up. And what you'll get is a correction line. That is, you'll, you'll have, because we have these roads going north, you know, north and south. The, the ones that go east and west, they're fine. They can just keep going. They're not going to get closer together. But the ones that go north and south, because they're making them straight at a certain point, they're going to have to make a correction line. They're gonna to have to move that road. So you, you, you're driving along north on, a, on what we call a, a range road. And all of a sudden that range road doesn't go straight anymore. You have to go to your right or left to find another range road. And, and that's a correction line. Okay, does that make sense to people? It's one of the ways. I I know that the earth is not flat because uh, then every surveyor would have to be in on the conspiracy. But uh, of course, are you sure it ain't flat? Yeah, I'm 100% certain. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, so what what's the purpose of a correction line? In, in, a, in a sort of metaphorical sense. How would, how, why am I mentioning a correction line and what we're talking about? Because these are lines, right? This is a it's line. So like, it, and it's so like when you come to a split in the road, you have to correct your bearing on one, on one of them splits. You have to <clears throat> figure out which one is the correct line and which one is the um, wrong line. Right. So there's there's going to be two. Uh, uh, in a sense, it's kind of like a fork in a road, because um, if you go one way. So let's say I'm driving on Township Road, um, you know, 14 or Range Road 14. Right. I'm going north on Range Road 14, which I've done. I used to live on Range Road 14. Um, and when I well, all of a sudden come to a T intersection. And there's a correction line. Um, it's it, usually it doesn't even tell me which way I want to I need to go in order to get to Range Road 14. Sometimes it does. Normally you just drive along, and all of a sudden you 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 got a T intersection. Now you could use you could use Miller's um, vision about the um, bear and the dog when he was um, he made yeah. had to take that um, journey. 
and he had it come to it split in a row. Okay. <coughs> okay, so the partition that encloses the temple court has a total of 300 cubits. You're talking about the sanctuary, the tabernacle? This is chapter 27 of Exodus. Yeah, so it's the tabernacle. And they're talking about the tabernacle. Yeah. And this is the this is the the hangings that surround the court is is 300 cubics. It's 100 cubics in one direction, 100 cubics on the other side and 50 cubics wide on both sides. So the total is 300. I thought I remember hearing that something about 300 before yeah. or totaling yeah. it up 300 before. Okay. So, um, so just uh, a little bit here, I'm just went to the website, Alberta land surveyors association, and they got uh, what a township is. So I'll show you this here. So here's the township layout in Alberta. So you can see the 36 squares. It's kind of interesting, they take each of these, um, so these are called uh, um, a section, and then each section is divided up into quarter sections. So people often, you know, would get in their, uh, when they got their, uh, what do they call it? Uh, you know, they'd move here originally, and then they get their, uh, I can't think of the word. Anyway. No, 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 no. They would uh, get their land apportioned from the government. There's a word for it. Um, uh, homestead. It would be called a homestead. So people would move to Alberta a long time ago, 100 years ago or more, and they would get a homestead. And the homestead would, uh, in order to keep that quarter section, you had to, um, you had to clear five acres. And build a house that was, build a structure and keep some some portion of it clear the same yeah. as in uh, america they had that in yeah. the early um, right. 1800s plus it went on beyond that yeah here was five you had to you had to uh have five acres cleared and for your land for for your house and and farming and then you could keep your your homestead and then it's kind of interesting uh, that they could divide this um, into 16, right? Now there's all these different types of lines here, which I don't understand everything here in this picture, but um, um, so they also have things called baselines. So it says townships are laid off their prescribed width along baselines running between the initial meridians. A baseline is a line approximating a latitude circle from which townships are projected north and south to the correction lines to be defined later. Um, see figure above to the right, baselines are four townships apart. The international boundary is the first baseline, the second baseline lines between townships four and five, third baseline between townships eight and nine. So I, I, I've never looked into this in so much detail. And then it talks about a correction line. Uh, correction lines are east-west lines, midway between baselines. So actually, it's the correction line is, is where that re, uh, range road is going to move over. over. So, uh, so you have this correction line, and, and then they're going to set those. And let's see if we can see here. So you see how these correction lines goes? So you're going to have a correction line, and then you're going to have... Um, and these are our townships here, right? These, each of these squares. So you can see the one to 36 here. And so you're gonna have these correction lines every once in a while. And what you do is you turn to the left. So you just have to know if you're going north, uh, if you're going south, you're gonna turn to the right. And, and it's just gonna be this little stagger of these roads, right? So you're going north and you need to know that because if you wanna go to, that's why they don't put the signs there generally. Um, and uh, where I used to live, Warburg, uh, the Warburg itself, the, the town of Warburg, let's say this is number six is Warburg. 
that's the town. It's actually a whole section. And this Highway 39 goes along here. And um, then there's this other part of Warburg that's on another section. So you got these two sections. And you're going north on um, 770, right? And then you, you have to turn left, go a little ways, and then you can go north again on 770. So, so you have this, um, this, this correction line. So Highway 39 is, in this part of it anyway, is a correction line. So, so anyway, it's, it's, to me, it's kind of interesting, but uh, especially because in the context of these townships being 36 by 36, or six by six, so 36 uh, sections per township. Okay, so I'll go back here. So it looks like there's some comments in the chats. It's okay, these are things, yeah, read some of them already. Okay, so, so now we go back here and, and I, I brought up a correction line because is this in some ways a correction line? What we see here in this part, and 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 do we see the staggered line? December twenty fifth to January eleventh. Do we see that as and and even the the two messages, the forty nine days, the Pentecost apart, or maybe I'm just you know a little too imaginative. You know. Can we see that, that this has been given to us as a correction line, so to speak, metaphorically? Because this is about the Sunday law, right? The 666. Am I drawing too many things in here? Am I being too abstract? Not really. Um, and is, is it a coincidence that um, I did a search just a few minutes ago and got that 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 length of the 300 and the response was 66 uh, hits on that particular, <laughs> you know, we get things from the most um, weirdest places. I seem to recall somebody saying this the other day is that we, we get inspired from some of the weirdest things that happen. <laughs> yeah. So what, what you see, I, I, I can see it's a weird thing that you come across and yeah, it, it's a way to relate it to this particular example. Um, yeah. And I can kind of see what you're actually talking about or where, you know, after you've given that little, I, I was just about ready to go, well, what's your purpose of, of telling us this? And then now you've shown us. Um, yeah. To me, um, it's not a stretch. No, because um, this relates to the Sunday law, relates to this Babylonian system that, that God is in conflict with. Let's put it that way, right? Right. And, and so we have been talking about the Sunday law. If you look at the pandemic, it's a type of the Sunday law. We have the 20th day of the ninth month, December 25th, 2021, which we marked as the Sunday law. And, and we had a certain way of thinking about these things, right? That is what we thought was going to happen with July 18th. And we also see on December 25th, 2021, Stephen was given the 777 years, which we looked into, right? Relating to um, 457 BC to 321 AD. So we, so we have all of these symbols together. And God is correcting us, right? We're on a correction line. So, so we're on the straight and narrow. But if we keep going straight, the way that if we're persistent and think that I have to just go straight, well, we're going to just run into a ditch, into the field, right? So God has to bring us, because we're in this Babylonian system, this world, he has to correct us 
right? Because we have wrong thinking. Right. So, I mean, there are different ways people yes. take it in an analogy, but it's an analogy that I think is meaningful in its symbols. Right. I think God, just like all the other measurements that God has given us, um, we find them as symbols and they speak to us. And, and to me personally, the townships and the correction lines speak to me, right? Just because I'm an Albertan. And so I understand these things. I know these things exist and um, I can see their connection to, to the Sunday law. So we need to be corrected. This movement needs to be corrected as far as understanding the Sunday law. And, and we have this counterfeit, right? So remember, um, one of the things that happens is they offer, when, when Samson goes down to Timna, uh, he gets offered the, the younger daughter, right? Which we say is representative of the Omega, right? The message of Parminder. Yeah, the message of Parminder, which I believe has still infected this movement. That is, we have a way of thinking and studying. Even though we rejected Parminder, we were able to, to resist that. But Parminder's message actually appealed to human nature. It appealed to our Babylonian way of thinking. And, you know, one of the things about Parminder's message is that Okay, I'm going to ask it this way. Was Parminder opposed to conspiracy theories? Parminder and Tess? No, not that I can tell. Okay, they were opposed to right-wing conspiracy theories, right? Yes. But weren't they teaching conspiracy theories? Yes, that's why I said, that's what I said, what right. I said. Yeah, they were teaching, you know, the Steele dossier. Is that a conspiracy theory? <laughs> a fabrication. Yeah, but but you know what I'm saying. That's what. What yeah. did you say? What did you say there, though? The steel dossier. The steel dossier. What is that? That was the collection of gossip that uh, they tried to find about Trump. Uh, oh, okay. All right. So that was the basis of the. I didn't. I didn't. I just didn't hear that term for it. No. Yeah. Russian, yeah. Russian collusion was a conspiracy theory. It was right. a conspiracy yeah. theory of the left, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Right? Pretty I mean, much. So this is part of the problem, is that when we follow conspiracy theories, we're not following Miller's rules. Yeah, we have to have, like, absolute proof. That's, that's the whole idea of Miller's rules, is... There, he is proof from the Bible and also proof from historical events that's happened. And we have to have ap ipso facto, not uh, well, something objective, right? Not speculative, also, you know, finding, you know, somebody saying that somebody said this or somebody saw this in and, and there's no way that we can ever verify it. It's all conjecture. Well, and it's gossip, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I don't care if it's about an individual or whatever it is. When we say something that we cannot possibly verify, that is, there's no way that we can verify, it, then it shouldn't be repeated by us. Doesn't matter what it is. It, it may go along with our beliefs, a belief about a person. We hear something about a person we don't like and, and somebody tells us a story and, well, that fits perfectly with what I think about that person. So it must be true. Yeah. So um, Isaiah 7, verse 4. Um, dealing with the false prophets, right? And, and so, and they say, and say unto him, take heed and be quiet. Fear not the faint hearted for the two tales of these smoking firebrands for the fierce anger of reason with Syria and of the son of Ramaliah. So 
This is the story, of course, dealing with these, uh, the 65 years. But here we have two tales, right? Right. Neither be fainthearted for the two tales of these smoking firebrands. So don't we have the same imagery here as in the story of Judges? Um, as I'm looking at it, it would seem that way. Yeah. Here, I, I'm not showing this to you, but... Um, yeah, so there, I was looking at the chart, just looking at the chart. Oh, looking at the chart, yeah. Okay, so so we can see that the, these two tales are here then represented. Now, you know, to really understand this story, because I don't think we understand Isaiah 7 to 12 completely yet. Um, I, I don't think we've broken down all the symbology to it. Well, I mean, it deals with the north and the south. It deals with... Um, all kinds of things. No, not, it's not just the start of the 20, 2520s that's here. I mean, there, there's lots of things tied up with this, um, right? And remember in chapter eight, uh, you're gonna have this mirror, right? Uh, write it, um, take the a great role and write it with a man's pen concerning Maher Shala Hashbaz, right? And, and this, is, this great role is actually a mirror Right. So this role. That's the, what the Hebrew uh, tells us. Yeah. So the, so the word role is a tablet for writing by analogy, a mirror as a plate, glass and roll is how it's translated in the King James. Uh, uh, Gilion, Gilion. So it's, uh, it's not a word that's very common, only twice in uh, the scriptures. But, but it's a mirror. So he's going to write this on a mirror. Um, and so we can see that this story here is about these structural chiasms, the chronological chiasms, because it's dealing with the 65 years, right? Which is a chiasm. It's a mirror, right? Um, but we also understand this as the law, right? So this great role is, is the law. And aren't the two tables... The law. Uh, yeah, the, the two tables are the law. Right. So if we look at back at this chart, I mean, the thing that we, we could struggle with, I'm going to give you the other option. So I've taken the position that Collins and Odilio studies are from God and that they're represented by the two loaves on Pentecost, that it is, it, it is light. Now, somebody could take it that these are just error, right? Somebody could take it and say, well, Collins and Odilio studies are just error. And yes. And it's use of the biblical chronology. I don't would take, be easy to do. Yeah. And I don't take that position because um, one is I have a great respect for both of them. But the other thing is the lines show us that they're part of this structure. And that really that this is about us being corrected. So the conviction that comes to me in these studies, so here is how I judge whether something's truth or not, is am I convicted by it? Right? Error never convicts me. Maybe, maybe that, you know, some people wouldn't think that that's a valid thing, but truth always presents a cross. Error doesn't. You know, the one thing I have against conspiracy theories is any person that I know that has been involved in them, I've never seen the conspiracy th theory bring a cross to that person in, in the sense that it's, it's always a self-justifying belief. So when you come into contact, when, when, I, when I saw Colin's study, I knew it was truth because of the conviction it brought and same with Odilia study it exposes to me exposed exposed to me my weakness my um so rosanna says would it be mine and colin study are the two tales okay so 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 in trying to answer her question so because we look at the two tales and we can just say, these are false prophets, 
There's the two tails of these smoke eating firebrands, right? So somebody could say, well, that's Colin and Odilio's presentation because both of them are bad, right? Um, and we could say, but if we connect it to the 300 foxes and we know that the work of Samson is taking these 300 foxes, so the symbol of it, but it's the tails of these two smoking firebrands, if you want to put it that way. Um, but this is something structural, right? That is, what we're seeing here is prophecy. Prophecy is being presented to us. And, and the question is, are we going to separate the precious and the vile? Are we going to be able to recognize the light that God has given us? So if I'm going to evaluate um, Colin's message and Odilio's message, uh, I'm going to evaluate it based upon Miller's rules. Now, I know because there's a conviction that I need to follow Miller's rules. So what a conviction does is it's not the ultimate evidence of anything, but it drives me to God's word and to prayer. to self-examination. And I still believe that when we look at what was presented, that there is light there that we can't just dismiss because there was some error mixed with it. That error is something that this movement inherited from Adventism, but, but it even goes further back. I mean, it, it comes from Babylon. It comes from our education. And, and this movement directly had, was infused with this error by Parminder's teaching. He mixed the truth and error together. And there are still many people who, whether they, you know, I mean, they rejected Parminder, I mean, what he was saying, but they still rejected it while accepting the premises, right? So we, we know yep. that we, we know that um, that Satan interjects error into truth so that we will discard all of it, basically. Yeah, um, we know that. So that tells me that there is truth in there to be discovered. So. We just need to be able to discern, like you said, like that that verse said. Um, we need to be able to discern that the error or uh, the what did you say? The precious. We need to be able to separate the precious from the vile. Yeah. And, and and so this is all that we're doing at this point. It's an exercise, and we're going to be using Miller's rules to separate the the truth from the vile. Mm-hmm. That's all. I mean, nobody should take offense to that because this is what we've been told to do. And mm -hmm. now it seems as though that that Collins was the one that came up with this on his own, right? Well, I believe God gave it to him. That's well, I know God gave it to him, but he, you know, he basically did this study on his own and mm -hmm. came up with this. And uh, if, if what I can tell, o Odelia was pretty much the same way, right? Yeah, he's just studying on his own, and then he knows. We know God uses these guys to show us things. And, but we just have to, everybody has to get together and look at this so we can discern the vile from the truth. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, that's all there is to it. I mean, so we, we've seen, personally, we've seen a few errors. I, I wasn't so hip to him at the beginning because I hadn't actually um, read Collins study, but once you had expressed the pro, you know, with certain disagreements and then the, the, the level of, of resistance um, from your, your interviewing questions uh, set my, um, my meter off. And so I finally went to you to see what it was that you'd seen. Exactly. I mean, I'd been hearing you, but I, I got to tell you, sometimes uh, you don't, uh, I don't catch things that you throw out there. I mean, 
that 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 April fifth. Uh, 2030 date i didn't never know how the heck you came up with that bro and, and and it was just a couple of days in in that number 260 that i actually figured it out you know so i mean things come to us in the in the speed that they do yeah. you know um we're not and the, all and the time on the same it. pack for sure on the same track yeah. we we just get together so we can kind of get to that same point you know, um, again, it, it's been, you've been talking about this 2030 date for quite a while. Well over a year. Well over a year. And, and I'm, I'm just now figuring out what it's, how you actually came up with it. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you spelled it out and I, I, I actually, yeah. you know, read it and seen it, but it took me to read it, to see it and go in no matter how many times I've heard it, 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 took something to trigger it i call that you know god kicking my butt yeah well <laughs> okay so, so anyway so we know that we have this um this truth and error mixed and and the question is are we going to throw the baby out with the bath water or not are we going to see in here that there is something very very precious now well, we've already seen that there's stuff there we just yeah. need to keep continue looking at it right but, but you understand the aspect of human nature, the, where we, because, you know, to some degree, what's happened is, you know, this has caused a division in the movement, which it shouldn't have. And, and we all have a part to play in that. I mean, we can all have sort of an attitude about other people, you know, especially if our feelings get hurt, you know, we, we can take sides in something. And, and when you get caught up in a dialectical environment, that is, um, what, what ends up happening is in order to win a debate, not, not necessarily with the other person, but just even in your own mind. So let's say somebody accuses you of something. Um, are you going to step on the ground on the premises that they have in order in your mind to defend yourself. So, um, you know, an example from history. Yeah, you're going to have to give me some sort of an example because I don't understand what you meant. So, so the Jews, they were um, conquered by the Greeks and they were surrounded by Greek thought. And Greek thought has its attractions. Now, in order for the Jews to defend themselves, even just in their own minds, from the accusations of Greek thought, they actually bought into some of the premises of Greek thought and, and developed their own system of philosophy so that they could appear in their minds that, that they were as sophisticated as the Greeks. The Seventh-day Adventist church did that, right? When we had these attacks from the evangelicals, on what ground did we defend ourselves? We, we buy into their basic ideas of how to study the Bible because we don't want to be seen as a cult, right? So people who opposed Parminder opposed Parminder to some degree on his ground, and his ground was political, wasn't it? Many people re rejected Parminder just because they're conservative and Parminder was a liberal. Did they really understand what it was they were rejecting? And in a sense, weren't they really just the same as Parminder? You understand that now? Does that make more sense? Yeah, somewhat. Um, I do get what, you, what you're talking about, uh, adopting uh, a philosophical uh, traits. Right. So, so we can't enter on Satan's ground to defend ourselves against Satan's attack. We have to, we have to be on God's ground, and God's ground is his word. It's a thus saith the Lord. Right. But often, we, when we get caught up in debate, us and them, we're, we're actually no different than them. You can never win that type of debate where you want to 
sort of win the other person, so to speak, by entering onto their ground. You're, you're entering into their arguments. And this, this is the problem with conspiracy theories. It's the problem with gossip. It's the problem with reputation and how people look at it. The question that we have to ask ourselves, am I willing to follow God, even if it, it shows that I'm in error? Well, I mean, that's what we want to see is that we're in error. Right? Don't we want to be corrected? Isn't This is never about justifying our own position, our own view of ourselves, our own understanding. This is about exposing our errors. And so these well, lines... How do we, how do we expose them? errors, though? Well, you compare it with truth. Okay. So... <laughs> But it's it's a matter of opinion as to as to what the truth is. A lot of times to people, it's my opinion over your opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we can't when we opinions. when we correct when we get out of the attitude of just you know no it's not your it's 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 me I mean um, it's my way not it's not your way it's my way and we continually do that all the time. Um, we don't we don't accept things from people i mean i i personally have heard some really good ideas come out of the people that i i least expected it to come out of it's just an observation yeah well god's so, taught me a lot of things from people that actually annoy me um, <laughs> um yeah okay I mean, you have you have actually made that statement before, um, and when you're talking about that lady and your, um, but but the, lots the of situations. I mean, it's not just. I mean, there's lots of situations because pretty much almost everybody annoys me. So, um, <laughs> well, I'm not joking. I'm telling you the truth. I I, I could easily be annoyed by other people. <laughs> no, I feel you, bro. I mean, I'm just you know. Yeah. Um, not too many people actually will confess stuff like that. So, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit impatient. I mean, I'm a very patient person, but in certain situations I'm impatient, you know? Um, so, you know, so I can be annoyed, but I've learned that I, I, when I feel annoyance, that just to me is God telling me, okay, pay attention. Right. Right something you need to to pay attention to if this is annoying you you need to pay attention yeah yeah i hate but i hate changing the subject for a minute but um in chapter 18 of um 27 exodus 27 Ch verse 18 yeah verse 18 is that where you got the 300 from yes so you did you multiply what you do you added it, it was it was two times the one hundred foot length, right. and two times the fifty foot width, uh, right. fifty cubic width. Yeah. All yeah. right. I just gonna make sure. But you had the five foot. You got five. Let's see. Yeah, but you're yeah. That's just other measurements. Ignore that. Okay. That's, that's just okay. about things up with the curtains and stuff. Okay. I just check in. I just making sure. Yeah, the curtains overlap in the front of the sanctuary. But um, I think that's what you're referring to, if I'm not. But the width yeah. is still 50 feet. Yeah, uh, 50 cubic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, the door yeah. or the entry was a separate dimension, I think. Yeah. Well, because the yeah, there's. A, I think the, it was 10 cubits, wasn't it? Yeah. I but anyway, it but anyway, the point we kind of have to to end here. So, so we've, we've just addressed this 300 a little bit more in depth. There's probably still more that, that we don't know. But I would say that we're in a correction line, that this, is, this line here is meant to correct this movement. Um, I'd like to just one more little observation I made while I was doing that, the, the 300 search. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, did you notice the dimensions of the arc? 300 by 50 by another there was one more measurement it was the height and it was 30 yeah is is there something there 
300, 50, 30. Um, I never noticed it before, but since we've been dwelling on numbers for a while, uh, I, I, I just, it just, you know, it clicks. Okay. Well, I don't know. I don't know what you're seeing. I mean, I know those measures. 50. What's the 50? We've just been studying this. Pentecost. Okay. And so what's the 300? Okay. The 300 uh, foxes or whatever. And what's the 30? The month. Mm -hmm. okay so okay. i mean it's just an observation that just smacked me in the face again just now okay would that 300 would that 300 be um wouldn't it be also the 444,000? i believe we've used it like in that manner I mean, you when said we were foxes, talking about the 300 Gideon. foxes. The 300 foxes is false. It's false, right? Yeah. Well, this, we're, yeah, this we're, is a, a, we're, yeah, we're taking this as a false message. I mean, a part of the false message, right? Because we're, we're connecting it to this structural chiasm and that this is meant to correct us. Right. But would, that, would, us. The three, would, the, would the art be a false message, though? No, no, because it's not a fox. It's not the 300 that makes it fall. Oh, it's the okay, fox. okay. All right. Yeah. Okay, well, we're going to close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for this study and that we could spend time examining these things. Um, be with us this afternoon in the study as well and um, continue to teach us. Be with each one. May your angels watch over us and um, that you can bring us together again to study your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.